Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. And Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in what we hope, what we believe are the closing months of this pandemic, we know that transformation is necessary, that we cannot go back to the world as it was. Arundhati Roy wrote at the start of this pandemic that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging all that we have, or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and to fight for it. What other world will we imagine? How will we bring it into being? Step lightly and with little luggage, beloveds, there is still much work to be done. Our chalice lighting words this morning are from the Reverend Jen Grayson, who writes, We come together every week, bound not by a creed or a mutual desire to please one god or many gods, yet we are drawn together by belief that how we are in the world, that who we are together matters. We light this chalice together in the knowledge that love, not fear, can change this world. This is the 150th anniversary of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln here in Nebraska. And as part of the celebrations over the course of the year, we're highlighting different stories from the congregation's history. We're playing excerpts of those stories as part of our services on Sunday morning, and then posting the whole story on our YouTube page. This morning, I'd like to invite Kathy Disney to tell us a little bit about the work that she's been looking into and the story that she knows well. My name is Kathy Disney, and I'm a member of the church's 150th anniversary committee. My fireside chat is about the Unitarian Church of Lincoln's involvement with two local organizations, Fresh Start Home and the Interfaith Housing Coalition. One of the problems of telling a story of recent history is that you can leave people out who are listening to your story. Many members and friends of our church were and are involved in the two stories I am going to tell, and I apologize for not mentioning everyone. If you have experiences to add to the telling of these two stories, let me know, and we will get them added. History of Fresh Start Home Thanks to Monica Zinke, Executive Director of Fresh Start, for providing a lot of this information. Fresh Start is a proactive agency focusing on eradicating homelessness for women through quality services and expanded partnerships. Fresh Start Home offers a safe, structured, alcohol and drug-free environment for women invested in attaining self-sufficiency. Services are offered to women ages 19 and older. The relationship between Fresh Start and the Unitarian Church of Lincoln goes back to Fresh Start's inception. In 1991, church member Virginia Hall and others 
recognized the need to provide services for homeless women in Lincoln, particularly those without children, as that population was seen to be underserved by existing programs. History of the Interfaith Housing Coalition and the President and Ambassador Apartments. The President and Amb Ambassador are two apartment buildings located at the corner of 14th Street and Lincoln Mall, directly across the street west of the Capitol Building. They were built in 1928 as apartment buildings. One family owned the building for over 50 years and then ownership changed a few times. In 1989, a need for affordable housing in downtown Lincoln led the city to commission a downtown housing study. The previous year, the president and ambassador had been purchased with the idea to turn one building into office space and to tear down the other for surface parking. As part of its conclusions, the downtown housing study noted that the president and ambassador apartment buildings were a major candidate for a conversion program. The following is taken from the Interfaith Housing Coalition Board Members Manual. Quote, the mayor, Mike Johans, got involved, approving city involvement in keeping the buildings as housing. With the mayor's blessing, the city's urban development department set out to save the buildings for housing and developed a plan to establish a nonprofit organization that could act as the general partner in a limited partnership that would purchase and rehabilitate the buildings and operate them as affordable housing. Charles Stephen, minister of the Unitarian Church, was contacted and indicated an interest in being involved. He contacted Otis Young, his friend and the minister at First Plymouth Congregational Church, who in turn contacted Rex Bevins from the St. Paul United Methodist. Our story today is called Not My Idea, a book about whiteness, and it is written and illustrated by Anastasia Higginbotham. When grown-ups try and hide hard things from kids, it's usually because they're scared too. They want to bury the truth, but deep down, we all know that color matters. Skin color makes a difference in how the world sees you and in how you see the world. It makes a difference in how much trouble seems to find you or let you be. In stores, in cars, on sidewalks, at school, your skin color affects the most ordinary daily experiences, including which neighborhoods welcome you. You may get the message that racism is happening only to black and brown people. Racism is a white person's problem and we are all caught up in it, mostly by refusing to look at it. But you can face this. Understanding the truth takes courage, especially a painful truth about your own people, your own family. Even people you love may behave in ways that show they think that they are the good ones. Racism was not your idea. You don't need to defend it. You can bring your curiosity to learn about it and see that it's true. In the United States of America, white people have committed outrageous crimes against black people for hundreds of years. All along, every step of the way, People who love justice and love each other have been fighting back. Many white people did things they never should have done, and many other white people failed to see the problem with this. These choices put wealth and power into white hands, homes, and neighborhoods. Some white people joined the leaders of Black liberation. Racism is still happening. It keeps changing and keeps being the same. And yet just being here alive in this moment, you have a chance to care about this, to connect. But connecting means opening. And sometimes opening feels like breaking. Go with your instincts on this one. Racial justice is possible, but only if we're honest with each other and ourselves. Your history is not 
all written yet. What is it that you want it to say? And that is the end of our story. Greetings, my name is Jean Helms and I serve as the Administrative Director at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. And we are creating this interview for the Share the Plate program. This month, the Share the Plate recipient is the Nebraska Native American Women's Task Force. And I am honored to welcome Colette Yellowrobe and invite her to go ahead and introduce herself. Hello, yes, thank you, Jean, or Nayish. You say Nayish, I am, thank you. I am Colette Yellowrobe, hello everyone. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Tribe, which is in Montana, and I grew up in Winnebago, Nebraska, reservation about a couple hours north of where I am right now. And my Cheyenne name is Von Hyatt, and I respond to both, so it's okay. It's ceremonial woman in English. I'm very proud of that part of my family history. It's a very strong name. And also I'm a mother and an educator at the University of Nebraska Lincoln and also a big activist, big scholar activist. And I say big because it's a big, it's a passion part of my life and I give way more time. With the task force, our focus has been missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And of course, two spirit or trans and men and boys has been the most recent expansion. What you see as the biggest hurdle at this point. Okay, you know, so yes, the pandemic is very, all three global crises are, I would say it's the erasure in common for Native Americans or indigenous tribal people. Mm -hmm. It's the way we've been erased so effectively in history. So there's a lot of pre-education we still have to do with MMIW or MMIWG, you know, and then the expanded mm -hmm. letters. So, so that people understand that it's, it originated out of Canada. That's mm -hmm. where the hashtag MMIW movement, you know, came from our Northern relatives, you know, I would say your word about collective is probably the best way because no one can own a cause. You have to think about it like that, you know, yeah. and it's unfortunate in social justice, racial equity, equality, advocacy. But I would say it's the erasure because people want to help, mm -hmm. especially in Nebraska. I am proud of us for passing LB 154. I believed in us. There was a lot of doubt, to be quite frank, back then. Mm -hmm. This was two years ago when we testified for it the first time at the unicameral. So I would say people can't connect because they have no idea the historical reasons that have led to this. Right. However, once you explain it, then it starts to make sense. And there's actually parallels. They, it, you know, they may understand in different ways. In Nebraska, we, all, we almost have all aspects of the medicine wheel. We just have to keep moving in, and we've been trying in the education efforts. Mm -hmm. You know, that social, mental, physical, and then spiritual. That's the four dimensions of a medicine wheel. It's grassroots work. Yep. Grassroots activism. Yep. But it also leads to, it can change policy, it can. It's time that we moved MMIWG Nebraska Task Force, Women's Task Force, to include our male, man, two-spirit partners and relatives. So as a result, we are going to host an event. We're looking at the end of February or March, we're gonna have a um, community gathering, maybe, I don't know if it'll be a vigil like we did for Ashley Aldrich, but it's gonna be a community gathering for our male relatives. Okay, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to do this. And it is truly my greatest hope that we can come and have you uh, speak in person once we're back in the building and host you um, at the church in whatever synergistic way that comes together. Um, I look forward to that. Yes, it'll be great. It'll be great. Thank you so much. It was so good to see you.
There's a river flowing in my heart. There's a river flowing in my heart, and it's telling me that I'm somebody. There's a Each week we set aside time in our service to reflect on the joys and sorrows in our lives as a community. This is an integral part of this work of being a beloved community, that we care about each other's lives. That as Jen Grayson says, we are drawn together by a belief that how we are in this world, who we are together, matters. We do this every week because we know that even as we are apart in this time, the ties that hold us to each other as part of this community are still very much there. So as this next song plays, we invite you to type your name or the name of somebody that you're holding in joy or sorrow this week into the chat box. Thank you for your presence.
All this month, we're talking about beloved community, what it is, what it feels like, and over the next two weeks, what some very specific programs are that might get us closer to this hope that lives out over the horizon of our lived experience. Particularly today, we're going to talk about the Beloved Conversations program that our congregation has participated in over the last six months. But before we do that, I, I want to back up a moment and talk about why we're doing it, why this is important. A year ago, last February, in one of the last in-person meetings before we closed the church building in response to the pandemic, our board of trustees gathered for a day-long retreat where we talked about what our hopes for the future of the congregation were. We talked about a lot of different pieces, about how excited we were at the launch of a second service, how we hoped to expand in the coming decade, and we set some goals for the coming year. And one of the things that came out of that retreat was the establishment of a task force to continue and in some ways begin the work of grappling with racial justice in our congregation and in Lincoln. And I know it sounds strange to, to say that we began this work a year ago because the history of this congregation's involvement with racial justice goes back much further. We've heard these stories as part of our 150th anniversary the programming. The, the first sermon that I preached as the called minister here in Lincoln was about the proposed eighth principle. That was four and a half years ago. But right now, this generation, this year, has brought a reckoning. In the past 12 months, we've seen in, in ways impossible to avoid how much there still is to do. And for those of us who are white, how the institutions that we've been a part of and loved have contributed to the system that killed George Floyd and so many others. This is heartbreaking, difficult work beloveds. I'm not going to claim that I have the answers. I'm not going to claim that anybody in the church has the answers. This work of building beloved community, of building a society where George Floyd lives, is hard. It's the work of generations, and for now we see but through a glass darkly. Each of us are going to come to the work of racial justice with our own lenses, our own experience. And that's a good thing. We are a covenantal people in this church. And for a couple different reasons, we're actually going to be talking about that a lot over the next three weeks. But at its most basic, what that means is that what ties us together as Unitarian Universalists is not that we all believe the same things. What ties us together is our shared commitment to how we will be together. What actions, what practices do we follow in order to be a sign and foretaste of the beloved community here, in this place, in this time? Four years ago, this, this congregation put words to the covenant that we share. And here's part of it. In day-to-day -day practice, we covenant to begin our interactions with an assumption of best intentions, to truly listen to one another rather than waiting for our turn to talk, to assure that what is true for each of us is heard and considered, and to share only our own stories, honoring the privacy of others. Now, there is a difference between intent and impact that's important to name here. We covenant to begin our interactions with an assumption of best intentions, but that is not the same thing as assuming that our interactions will never result in harm. Sometimes we can have good intentions and also have a negative impact. But what that also means, what the covenant also means is that we will not assume that we are here to hurt each other. Some of the most damaging things I, I have seen 
happen in conversations about race, conversations about covenant, and in Unitarian Universalism have been accusations that others are not sufficiently committed to justice, to our faith, whatever the topic of the conversation is. And the reason that that's so damaging, the reason that that's so poisonous is is twofold. First, it breaks down the covenant of trust that we have with each other. But it is also a terrible organizing strategy. Just simply as a practical matter, nothing alienates a potential ally faster than telling them that they are an insufficient ally. So we are not going to do that. But if we can acknowledge instead that good intentions can have negative impacts, then we can change our behaviors in a non-anxious way. We can say, I did not know that this thing that I was doing was harmful. And so now that I know, I'm not going to do it anymore. We're going to do that as a church. We're going to spend time talking about race this year. In the coming months, we're going to take action in our congregation and community based on what we learn. But we are going to do so in the context of our covenant, because that's who we are. That's how Unitarian Universalists do things. We are covenantal, and that has to mean more than the preacher saying that we are covenantal every month or two. Just to make it explicit, here's what that means. Last week, the Task Force on Dismantling White Supremacy that the board set up a year ago sent out a survey to the congregation asking questions about your perceptions of the congregation. And the reason for that survey was and is not to judge, not to declare anyone an insufficient ally, but to understand where we are right now so that we know where we can go as a community in the coming months and years. And that's hard work, but it's work that we are in together as a congregation, in covenant with each other. For the rest of this morning, we're going to do something actually a little bit different in in place of this sermon going on. Over the past six months, over 40 members of the congregation here have participated in the Beloved Conversations program through Meadville Lombard Theological School. And Beloved Conversations is a structured program of reflection on race, justice, and dismantling white supremacy. As we talk this month about participating in the Beloved community, about helping to bring into being the world we dream of, this is one of the ways that we do it by learning about the hard stuff, leaning into places where we don't often look, talking about covenant, talking about how we hold each other. Through all of that, we deepen our capacity to participate in beloved community. Several of our members who participated in the Beloved Conversations program this fall agreed to talk about that experience for this service. After this next song plays, we're going to hear from them. And as we do, if you participated as well, think about the relationship between the program you participated in and this work of beloved community that we are about as a church. And if you did not participate this fall, know that there is a spring session starting up next month. We'll have some more information about that later in the service. For now, will you please join me in singing our next hymn?
Well, thanks for, for setting up a time to do this. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so mostly I'm, I'm going around and I'm just hitting record and then asking folks about their, their experience and beloved conversations. Okay. And I'll remember at the beginning this time to ask, could you introduce yourself, uh, your name and your pronouns as we start out? Absolutely. So I'm Lori Stratman and my pronouns are she, her and hers. Hi, um, I'm Judy Hart. I'm a, a member of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Ah, yes, my name is Stacy Sinclair, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Okay, well, I'm Linda Brown. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I recently participated in the Beloved Conversations on Dismantling White Supremacy because um, I had the time, first off, but also I had uh, the interest in being a student. Um, you know, you get to that place in your life where you think that you're a teacher, but it's a humbling experience to become a student again. So it was really um, important to me to have some guidance on how to do this work of dismantling white supremacy. Well, you know, I attended GA in Kansas City right after your ordination installation and when I went down there the look of us Unitarians has changed dramatically to a black and brown leadership I mean and women there were women all over in leadership and it was so different from when the only other time I'd been to GA was 45 years ago when I went to Minneapolis I was 31 then, and at that point, the leadership was mostly white male. I loved seeing what was going on in Kansas City. It was incredible. And I went to several workshops that were given by black or brown people. And I mean, they were honestly telling their stories there's stories about how things had not gone so well in the denomination as I would hope it, they would. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of took me back. I, I just, I was intrigued and I'd sit in these workshops and I'd hear people around me talking about their congregations experience with the beloved conversation program from Meadville. And they seemed to really feel like it was a good experience for them. So I was, I was intrigued. I was invited, if you will. I was looking, I have been, and I continue to look for opportunities to process some of that, not just how do I become a better person, but then how can I work to change things? And so Beloved Conversations seemed like a good opportunity. It came up at the right time when I was ready to spend some time and invest in doing some of the work. Yeah. A couple of things. So um, I helped found the task force for dismantling white supremacy for the church. And so not only did I feel that I was obliged to, to participate in this program, but I was really excited to do so. Um, we had just finished up uh, within our task force a workbook called Me and White Supremacy by Layla Said. And it was a really eye-opening exercise. And uh, Beloved Conversation sounded kind of like that on steroids, if you will. So um, I felt like doing the deeper plunge into that work was the next logical step for me. Well, I think I had previously kind of avoided increasing my understanding of white supremacy. In fact, I was, I was actually confused. White supremacy, white nationalism, 
they were just kind of all a little blur that I hadn't really sorted out. I had certainly not looked at my own white privilege. And then I also think that I was really disturbed by the story of Amy Cooper in Central Park, uh, the woman who I believe is a self-described liberal um, who in a moment of discomfort or distress or embarrassment weaponized her own whiteness and had circumstances not been, a, had been, if they had been a little different then Chris Cooper might've died as well. Mm-hmm. And I recognized my capacity to be Amy Cooper. I think that I could in my own discomfort, even though I am a well-intentioned person, even though I want to believe I'm a good person, that I find myself having the same tics as anybody who hasn't really examined their own internal racism. I think the biggest thing that I learned is that even though I've been doing my own work over many years on, on my racially based biases, that I still had a lot to learn about uh, me and others who are doing this work as well that I still have pockets of assumptions that can be harmful to others. And um, it's really a lifetime's work to root those out and examine them and then trade them for a deeper listening uh, to those individuals that I had assumptions about. Mm. That's been huge for me. I don't know. How has it been for you? Are you just started or do you feel like you've kind of done it now? Mm. I don't think we've ever done it. You know, I I think. No, I mean, for yourself. Right. Right. Well, for myself, I don't, I don't know that it's ever a thing that I'll be done with. Um, But I don't think it's, I don't think it's a thing that I get to be done with ever. You know, because I, the, the lived reality for me is that the, the body and social position I inhabit is one of uh, a straight white guy in America in 2021, which means that I have to be constantly aware of how that identity and that, that position is read in the world. Um, and I think I think it's really important for folks like me to to say, you know, we are we are granted a lot of authority that we don't earn, and so how do we point that not at us, but towards Lord and towards colleagues of color and towards movements for justice that we don't lead. <laughs> Um, and that's, that's an ongoing thing. And that's an ongoing thing that we have to continually check in with ourselves and each other about. Um, so I don't know, (laughs) this is a long answer to your question, but I don't know if there's ever going to be a moment where I'm like, I get it now. Um, You know, one of the things that I don't think we've talked about, but but um, is worth mentioning, is that the curriculum follows sort of a three-part structure. This year, they're really talking about within, so talking about um, us as individuals. But then I think the next the next piece of it will be talking about among sort of how we think about the role of white supremacy explicitly and implicitly. In, in the institutions that we form. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious as somebody who's on the board, like what, what do you look forward to in that work or, or what do you dread in that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, what I'm looking forward to is being able to do things that will feel more tangible to our members, mm-hmm. 
we'll be looking at those biases and, and um, pockets of white supremacy that are inherent um, and, and integrated into the church, whether that was intentional or unintentional, and rooting those out and, and working as a group to change how we do things for the better. Um, so I think that's going to be really exciting work. Um, the thing I'm dreading, um, it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> Truth be told, I mean, it, it's going to take uh, a lot of eyes, a lot of hearts, um, to do this in a, in a meaningful way that um, honors and respects everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn that on you. What are you uh, excited about or dreading about this? Um, well, the dreading is easier because that's, that's the exact same answer. It's just a lot of work. I mean, it's just... It's just a lot of work. One of my um, mentors, I, I've preached about this before and I will again, but um, Natalie Fenimore um, was on the Commission on Institutional Change, which is doing, made recommendations um, for this work at the, at the UUA level. Um, and their final report was something like 200 pages long and had well over a hundred discrete recommendations for churches, regions in the UUA. Um, and every time I try and like grasp the magnitude of that challenge, I, my brain sort of skitters off of it and says, no, 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 not this year. Um, but the exciting part of it um, is that it's it's work that, to me, it's be it's it's pretty clear that this is work that encompasses the whole of who we are as a congregation. Um, it's not simply this little silo over here that we, if we do it well, then we'll have done racial justice well. Uh, sure, but but to do that well, we actually expand the capacity of who we are as Unitarian Universalists for, for everybody. Um, there's this idea um, of adaptive design, right? This is in, in sort of building accessibility where if you, if you build a physical space to be accessible to everyone, to not have steps in it, to have wider corridors, then the reason you do that might be to make the building more accessible to folks in wheelchairs, but the, the side benefits of it are well past that. And we actually have a pretty recent example of that in our church building where the, the impetus, as I understand it, was the bathrooms were not fully accessible. And so the process of how do we make our bathrooms accessible and welcoming became this this project that says a lot about who we are and, and how open our space is for folks to come into um, and what our values are in terms of sustainability. And that all, all became, that all came out of this question of how welcoming are our toilets, right? <laughs> so, right. So, <laughs> so for me, that's the exciting part is, is you know, any one of those 150 recommendations that the Commission on Institutional Change made might be the, that spark for us to, to really broaden our sense of welcome and who we are. Um, but there's 150 to work through. <laughs> And not all of them are going to be that spark. Some of them are just going to be hard work. Um, and that's okay, too, because mm -hmm. that's, 
you know, part of the disciplines, uh, part of the discipline of a, a, a faithful life is doing things that are hard sometimes because they're important to do, not because they have mm-hmm. a reward at the end. So new, I mean, I had looked at it because a dear friend had given it to me. And I knew that if he cared about that, then I probably would too. But every time I'd look at that book, I'd think, I don't think I'm up for that because I thought it would be too painful. And, mm-hmm. and in a way, mm-hmm. some of this is, but mm-hmm. I'm glad mm-hmm. I'm started now. How, how do you move through that pain, that, that painfulness? You know, I, I remember back in the women's search, if you will, where we intensively were looking at these black or white feminists, black feminists, lesbian feminists, it got to be so painful. I really had to withdraw for a while. It was just so saddening to actually realize how much of a B-class citizen I was. I mean, how did I not know that earlier? Um, This time, I feel like, yes, I've done the the beloved conversations, but I, I'm still way in process. I feel like it's just a beginning for me. And I have moments of pain, moments of incredulity, like watching the film 13. It's on Netflix now, and I've probably watched it three times now. My daughter said that I watched it with her and my grandson probably three or four years ago. I don't even remember it then. I mean, every time I watch that, I see, I see more. And it, maybe it's because I'm allowing myself to take in more of the horror of what we are doing, what we are still doing in our prison system. Oh, this is this dismantling white supremacy isn't anything that we can do alone. We're going to need to grab hands, and we're going to have to uh, fight this war together. Um, one of us is easy to knock down, but three hundred of us is not. So, for us to have a voice in this community, it's really going to take many people who have had this experience, so that we have uh, a commonality that we can start talking about. Anything else that you want to talk about with beloved conversations? Those are the those are oh, the set questions, but <laughs> right. <laughs> well, um, as as part of the task force, I just want to put it out there that um, folks who are thinking about doing spring um, need to get their registration information in um, no later than the twenty fourth. Um, we're going to go ahead and sign a church again. So uh, we'll do a a registration through a Google form that will be sent out through an e-blast. And by the time people see this recording, um, they should have that e-blast. We'll sign up through that Google form, pay the money to the church. Gene will get the money sent to Beloved Conversations, and then we'll get a coupon code to sign up for our lessons. Mm -hmm. So um, it's important to to get that in right away. There's also uh, different types of scholarships available that are outlined in the e-blast. So be on the lookout for that.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen. <laughs>